She's a highly sensitive person, and you might be too. If you cry easily, if you're very sensitive to what people say to you about uh, how you hit them, uh, if there is uh, keying into other people's emotions, a big part of your interaction with other people, you may be someone who feels things very, very strongly. Now, there can be advantages to be a highly sensitive person, but also uh, they can be difficult to manage all those emotions. With us is Dr. Judy. Judith Orloff, psychiatrist and author of Emotional Freedom, Liberate Yourself from Negative Emotions and Transform Your Life. Dr. Orloff, welcome back. Oh, thank you, Larry. It's good to be on your show. I wanted to ask you about uh, this conference last week where for the first time uh, the science of studying highly sensitive persons was conducted. Do you think this is an area that maybe has been overlooked until recently? Well, as a psychiatrist, I know it's been overlooked because I specialize in treating highly sensitive people and they get misdiagnosed all the time. But the brain science behind being a highly sensitive person is coming out. And the beauty of the discussion of mirror neurons, those neurons in our brain that allow us to have compassion for other people have an amplified ability in highly sensitive people so that if you see your partner, let's say being hurt and being cut or being, you know, in pain in some sort, your mirror neurons fire and you feel it in your own body and highly sensitive people feel it more strongly than other people. So what are the ways you, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to, I was going to say, what are the challenges in helping your clients be able to manage that, to be able to get the benefits of it without breaking down all the time? Yes. Well, I'm a highly sensitive person myself, so I have a tremendous interest in the subject because I've had to really learn to manage my emotions and my energy. Yes. First of all, I give my clients a quiz. Are you a highly sensitive person? And oftentimes, you know, they've been called overly sensitive all their lives. If a friend is distraught, they start feeling it too. They get overwhelmed in crowds. They're emotional sponges. They often like to take their own car places because they get overstimulated by being in a a social situation for too long. It's hard for them to drive the freeways because, especially in L.A., because they're so intense. And so, number one, the highly sensitive person has to know they're not crazy because they think they're crazy or they're hypochondriacs. And they are not. We are not. But you have to learn how to manage your own energy if you're a highly sensitive person. And that means learning how to set clear limits and boundaries with people. It means taking a lot of alone time um, because highly sensitive people need to take alone time. It's key to their well-being. Um, It means learning how to find jobs and relationships that are really supportive of your abilities, your highly sensitive uh, gifts. I believe that being a highly sensitive person is a tremendous gift. And certainly as a psychiatrist, it increases my empathy for people. It increases my intuition. It it increases my ability to put myself in other people's shoes to know how they're feeling. You know, which is amazing. Uh, Judith, you, you, uh, you might be a fan of this line. I think it was from Annie Hall where Woody Allen says, as long as there's anyone suffering somewhere in the world, it's hard for me to have a good day. That's an extreme example of what you're talking about. <laughs> also, his movie Zelig. I don't know if you ever oh, saw I that. Oh, I love Zelig. Great movie. But that's that's an empath. That's a highly sensitive person where he turns into actually the person that he's with. And there's one incredibly funny scene where he turns into the Orthodox rabbi. That he's that's with. Always so funny. <laughs> we complete with beard, everything. 866-893-KPCC. Do you consider yourself a highly sensitive person? Do you live with someone who's highly sensitive? And is that a source of conflict or benefit in your life? You can even take a quiz that we have up right now on the AirTalk page at kpcc.org to determine 
where you fall on this range, because it's not yes or no, black or white. It's, you know, where are you on this um, this bell curve for highly sensitive people? 866-893-KPCC. The quiz is on the AirTalk page, kpcc.org. In addition to Dr. Orloff, we're joined by Bianca Acevedo, who is the research scientist specializing in psychology at UC Santa Barbara. It was involved in a study uh, that uh, has just been conducted looking at highly sensitive persons. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Acevedo. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Uh, Explain to us what you found in looking at the neurological responses in highly sensitive people. So uh, basically what we did was we looked at the brain activation patterns of 18 individuals in response to looking at images of their partners and strangers who were displaying either happiness, sadness, or neutral facial expressions. And what we found was that across all these various conditions, people who were higher on the highly sensitive trait showed greater activation in areas associated with awareness and action planning, as well as empathy, um, as reflected in the mirror neuron system and other activation patterns that have been consistently found in studies of empathy. And they also showed activation in areas associated with the integration of sensory information. And this doesn't tell us why the brain is operating in that manner, but... What are your theories as to why you see these differences? We um, believe that this confirms uh, the uh, case studies and theoretical evidence on being a highly sensitive person. So some of the characteristics associated with being highly sensitive are pausing to check in situations, deeper level of processing, more empathy, and um, greater responsivity to environmental and social stimuli. So all of the areas that we found reflected all of the traits that are known to be characteristic of highly sensitive individuals. Dr. Orloff, just, you know, I know there's not evidence of this necessarily, but do you think this is largely hereditary? We're looking at at something that has to do with, uh, you know, the brain structure or neurochemicals that are there at the beginning. You know, as a psychiatrist, I've seen that the highly sensitive person traits runs in families. And oftentimes, if the mother or father is highly sensitive, the child can be highly sensitive. So it makes a lot of sense to me that it's transmitted genetically and also environmentally because parents are models for their children. And it's very important that parents learn how to raise empathic children so that they can be well-balanced in their their empathy and their sensitivities. So, yes, definitely. And it was passed down in my family on my maternal side, from my grandmother to my grandmother to me. And so, you know, we've really had to learn to manage as women, just through the, the women in our family, you know, how to be a highly sensitive woman and how we can make that serve us and not just be exhausted and tired and overwhelmed and overstimulated all the time, which is the case with many highly sensitive people. Well, does that lead to um, self-medication? Because if you're feeling everything so strongly, is there uh, a problem with HSPs wanting to numb out a little bit to not feel so strongly? Now, that is an excellent question because there's a high correlation between substance abuse and being an HSP and feeling overwhelmed. Oftentimes, the people I work with in 12-step programs say I drank and used because I was just so sensitive I couldn't bear the world. It was just overwhelming to me. And so part of my treatment with patients is to help them you know, get more centered and stronger and not absorb all the stress in the world so that they don't have to drink and use. So that's one element to substance abuse. 
Love to hear from listeners. If you consider yourself a highly sensitive person, you have someone close to you that is, share your experiences with us at 866-893-KPECC or the AirTalk page, kpecc.org. We have a self-quiz that you can take, uh, probably very similar to the one Dr. Orloff uses with her clients to help determine whether you are, in fact, a highly sensitive person. Um, The estimates I've seen, about 20% of the population fall into this category of feeling things very intensely. We've talked about some of the good sides, but there's challenge too. When you feel things so strongly, it can be uh, daunting to go through life and to feel that strongly. Uh, Intimidating, frightening, um, make it difficult to relate to people, even to operate with that much sensory input that an HSP is picking up all the time. 866-893-KPCC or the AirTalk page, kpcc.org. Julie in Inglewood, are you a highly sensitive person? Uh, yes, I am. It's uh, It's been debilitating sometimes, but through therapy, I've learned that other people's stuff is what I call it. it a lot of times it's not my own, and I have to just um, let them keep their stuff and not take it on so that I can draw a boundary and a limit that way and still function with everything I need to do in, in daily life. How does this play into, if at all, in your relationship? Uh, yeah, my husband is not a sensitive person at all, and at the same time he can be very direct, and so he uh, he's angry or moody or upset about something that I've said or done that um, he doesn't agree with. I've had to learn also to kind of put up a a shield and um, not let myself feel guilty or, or bad or too sensitive to what he may think um, because I, you know, can only control how I choose to react to that. And I'm choosing to to be, have more confidence in myself and not let it uh, get me down or immobilize me. Does he get frustrated with your sensitivity or has he come to get used to it? Um. Uh, I think yeah. Sometimes I think it might it might frustrate him, um, but uh, yeah. But at the same time, he probably has gotten used to it. But it's still a, a source of difficulty sometimes in the way we communicate with one another. Julie, I appreciate your calling us so much. Thanks for sharing your experience. We're at eight six six eight nine three KPCC. The Air Talk page kpcc dot org. Michael in Long Beach, you're on Air Talk. Uh, Hello, I had a stroke about uh, three years ago and went from being a, you know, relatively well-balanced, sensitive, insensitive male to being a very sensitive person. And I feel as though I uh, actually um, have felt some advantage to this. That's interesting. So you feel things much more intensely than before the stroke. And was that apparent from early in your recovery from the stroke? Yes. I noticed it when I watched a a, uh, Lassie Come Home movie at at home, and I started weeping like a child over the death of Lassie. (laughs) And 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 you— I would never have wept over a movie. Yeah. And you think it's it it's more of something structurally that happened in your brain, or do you think it's it's the yes. traumatic experience you went through? No, I think it was entirely structural. The pons region of the brain was affected, and that has a direct effect on emotion and a few other cognitive issues. Fascinating. Michael, I appreciate it so much. Dr. Orloff, you want to respond to that? I do. Um Michael's um, experience is so touching and it's so true because when the brain function is altered a bit, it can enhance sensitivity. And I applaud the highly sensitive man. And I think for Michael, from my point of view, this is a step forward, you know, in terms of being open emotionally and with your sensitivities, but you have to learn how to ground them and center yourself so you're not crying over everything. Because what happens with highly sensitive people is they become overly emotional and an emotional sponge. So they take on the stress and the sadness and the suffering in the world. And that's not emotionally healthy. And in emotional freedom, I talk about, you know, how do you counsel 
people in relationships where one is a highly sensitive person and the other isn't. Yes, there needs to be a big educational process that goes on so that both partners can be in sync. So just in response to your other caller as well. And so there are certain techniques that can be developed to coexist in a really harmonious way. Um, so um, highly sensitive people, I believe, are going to save the world, basically, because they're open and sensitive and loving and compassionate, but they need to learn skills to manage it. Uh, I, I went through a period of my life where for a number of years I didn't cry, and, and I lost that, and I felt like it was you know, tremendous tremendous thing that was lost in that period. Um, and fortunately, that's no longer the case. But I wonder for people who who uh, shut themselves down emotionally as a way of dealing with that, you know, what what's the trade-off with that? Well, the trade-off is that you shut down your heart and you shut down your emotions and you're not a full person. And people, highly sensitive people do that just as a last-ditch effort because they're so overwhelmed. But, you know, as a psychiatrist, I really know that you can manage these abilities and your life is better. And as a highly sensitive person, I would never want to give it up. It is such a gift to me in terms of my compassion, my awareness, my ability to tune into the world and experience life. And as you said, cry. I think it's so fantastic that you reclaim that ability. You know, to be able to live life to the fullest, um, highly sensitive people can do that. Now, if they learn to manage specific things and being in relationship is a challenge for a lot of highly sensitive people because they can't do the same kind of togetherness that other couples can do. They need a separate space. They need their separate sleep time. Sometimes they, they need they have different rules they go by. So it's a creative conversation that I have with my patients. And I describe in my book, you know, how do you handle being in a relationship and being highly sensitive? You know, how do you handle going through an illness and being highly sensitive? How do you handle being at work in a career and being around people who are draining you and you're taking it on? And how do you exist in a work environment. These are all skills that are learnable, doable, and all highly sensitive people can learn them. Dave in Hollywood, you're on Air Talk. Hi. I, my wife is a highly sensitive person. Uh, about eight years ago, she was uh, diagnosed with bipolar disorder uh, and also borderline personality disorder. Um, she was put on um, Lamictal and Depakote uh, mood stabilizers, um, uh, a number of years later, she uh, weaned off of them in order to plan for a pregnancy. Since then, she's visited uh, a doctor who has told her that she does not have bipolar disorder, uh, named highly sensitive uh, as a classification that she could fall into, and, and also gave her a diagnosis of, uh, of a depression disorder. Uh, I wonder if, if highly sensitive people are diagnosed or misdiagnosed with mood disorders and if they're related that's a great question, Dr. Orloff. Yeah, as a psychiatrist, I see that all the time, and it's a travesty. I get hear so many stories where highly sensitive people get put on antidepressants, lithium, um, anti-anxiety meds when the HSP qualities are not dealt with. All right. However, there is a mixture of people with bipolar disorder and HSP. So, you know, I would have to really diagnose the person in order to find out what's what. But in terms of the treatment for highly sensitive people, it's not primarily meds. It's behavioral intervention strategies that you can make um, that could change everything. Uh, we've had a few people have trouble finding the quiz. Let me just explain. It's sort of buried into a... Uh, uh, paragraph where it asks, so what does it mean to be an HSP? And there's a hyperlink you can click on for the quiz. 866-893-KPECC or the AirTalk page, kpecc.org. Rick in Studio City, you're on AirTalk. Hi. Uh, this has been so illuminating. Uh, I thought there was something wrong with me. Um, I would cry when somebody won the big deal on Let's Make a Deal. <laughs> I, you are sensitive, yes. Yeah. And it was a sob. It wasn't just, oh, you know, smile, happy tears. It was a choking sob I had to hold back. I yeah. mean, it's just, I, I, and now I'm in a, a profession where I, you know, help people who have lost someone to suicide. I do bereavement services, 
And as they're telling their story, I'm crying with them. I, I just, it's like, I don't know. It, it, it's nice to know that there may be something, you know, specific that I can look at because I, it, when my wife sees me choking, she knows I'm trying to keep from crying when I've seen something very happy happen on TV or in the family. Yeah, and it's interesting. It's not just something sad, but something happy that you have the emotional response to. And it sounds like you found a perfect way to use your sensitivity to help people that are going through the most difficult experience in life. Rick, I appreciate it so much. Uh, Dr. Orloff, quick comment on Rick. Yeah, it's very important that Rick replenish himself after his amazing work that he does so that he's able to self-nurture. Where I've seen um, emotional impasse or HSPs go wrong is they work in these very demanding, compassionate professions, but don't take time out to replenish. So it's very, very important that you do that if you're an HSP in a helping profession. Callie in Culver City said, I had a daughter 10 years ago, highly sensitive, died from an accidental drug overdose at age 21. Absolutely was related to her high sensitivity, an artist, a poet. She had the gift and the demon. And um, let's see, we have Iris in San Clemente. I'm blown away. This is me. I smoke pot because it chills me out. I deal with animals more than people because animals love my sensitivity, but people don't. You can share your comments on the AirTalk page, kpcc.org. Thank you, Dr. Orloff, author of Emotional Freedom.